one we do like every Sunday. <laughs> Y'all don't remember that? <laughs> Try it again. Okay. Let's go back and do the other verse again. We'll just do that one again. That'll be our last verse. No, it won't. good to have you here and we want to be in prayer for uh, Rex and Mary Cobb Baptist Bible Translators Institute they're doing a wonderful work and of course the COVID like every place else has hit them as well uh, but they still have uh, uh, students there and they're teaching them how to take a lang uh, language that's spoken and breaking it down and produce a written language so that they can eventually produce Bibles so it's just a tremendous work and even missionaries that have Bibles in their language can learn language better by learning the principles of language that they teach. So it's a tremendous ministry. So be in prayer for them. They're real good folks. Of course, be in prayer for Pastor and Miss Terry. They'll be traveling back either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, and so be in prayer that they have safe travels and can get back here and join us again. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for what you have done in our lives. Lord, we do thank you for the coming of the Comforter. What a blessing it is to have that Holy Spirit uh, dwelling within us and uh, speaking to us and opening the scriptures to us and indeed bringing comfort to us when we need it. And we thank you for that. Father, bless our service this evening. May we uh, hear from you and be sensitive to what your Holy Spirit will say. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Okay, we have a missionary letter from the Israel Alvarez family, missionaries to Belize. Hello from Belize. May our Lord be with us all in this time of uncertainty. A truth we hold dear is the fact that God is still in control of the world, no matter how quickly events and times change. We rest in his promises each day, each hour, each moment. We'd like to encourage you, our dear supporters, to choose faith over fear, to choose the Almighty over anxiety. We thank our Lord for good health for our family. We live in a small town, and the virus has finally reached us here. There are hundreds of cases with the numbers still rising. We try to comply with the social distancing while we endeavor to help and encourage our members. Since we aren't allowed to hold church services, we have done sermons online. We have continued to visit people in their homes to try to encourage those who are unable to get out and about. It's so easy for folks to become anxious and depressed when the regular pattern of life is disrupted. Sometimes an email or a message is all it takes to revive a hurting heart. Our vacation Bible school in August went very well. We kept it very low key since there were restrictions in place. VBS took place before the outbreak of the virus cases, so the limitations were not as bad as they are now. We had around 60 kids and seven mothers attend each day. Our hearts were very encouraged to have 14 of our teens and adults show up each day to run the program and take care of the kids. Each person present was given a clear explanation of the gospel 
and 20 children and adults raised their hands in profession of faith. Wonderful is the only word to describe our joy. Our mission church in Curzal celebrated its two-year anniversary in August. We were not allowed more than 25 people per service, so we hosted services in different locations at the same time. In total, we had 60 people attend a service, with 25 being first-time visitors. Many people trusted Christ as their Savior. In August, we also took on another children's ministry. Uh, in Belize, the children have an hour lunch break in which they go home to eat. They then return to school to finish the school day. This program seeks to help kids who may not be getting lunch during that time. Our church volunteers will make a lunch each day, and any kid who needs to can come and eat at the church, which is very close to a big primary school. During the lunch hour, we also provide a Bible lesson and fellowship with the children. Since the schools here have yet to reopen, we have been delivering groceries to the families of the kids instead. Please pray that when the schools reopen, this ministry can be a blessing to those in need. On October 4th, our main church here in Orange Walk will celebrate its 11-year anniversary. We greatly desire to hold in-person services for this event. Please join us in praying that the social distancing restrictions will be lifted enough to have services again. We're very thankful for your love for us and our family. May our God richly bless you, the Alvarez family. So, a good report from them, still being faithful in the midst of restrictions, restrictions. Okay, any spe special prayer request requests that we have this evening? Yes, brother. Uh, last week I mentioned Michael Chevron, probable uh, liver cancer. Then I had a friend call me today. His name is Trace. And Trace asked me to pray. He's facing some legal challenges. So pray for Trace. Okay. So again, Michael Chevron facing liver cancer. And Trace has some legal difficulties he needs prayer about. Oh, and of course, be in prayer for the Alvarez family. All right. Who else has a prayer request? Yes. by the specialist, so that appointment is finally set up for next week, wow. which will make five weeks that he's been in a wheelchair waiting to have that looked at. And then they also found out that he has another spot of skin cancer, but this time it's close to his eye, but they have this determined that it is cancer, but they're going to remove what they can and hopefully get all of it, um, but then they'll biopsy to see if, if it's further than what they think or not. All right. Scott's stepdad, uh, still waiting on somebody to see him, the specialist to see him about his broken foot. And then has developed some skin cancer, so do be in prayer for that need, please. Yes. Okay, Andrew's father with uh, heart issues. Be in prayer for him. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and break up then into groups of two or three and spend some time in the, with the Lord in prayer.
All right. Do be in uh, continued prayer for the Faith and Family Conference coming up October 11th through 13th. And ask the Lord to prepare your heart, as I will, and pray prepare for preparation of the hearts of those who will minister to us and then folks that we should get in contact to encourage them to come. So it could be a, a great time for our church as we obey the Lord. Take your Bible tonight and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read um, verses 3 through 14. So if you'd follow along with me there while I read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians was a letter that the uh, Apostle Paul wrote from a prison in Rome one of the so-called prison letters. And uh, if you can imagine, the passage that we just read was really upbeat. It was really encouraging. He was really uh, thinking of the blessings of the Lord and wanting to pass them on. And then think back that he's sitting in probably one of the worst places you could be in that time period, in a Roman prison. And uh, yet he could write because he had his focus on what he was writing about, the spiritual blessings that God was laying on his heart to write to the Ephesians. The Holy Spirit was moving him to write to the saints there in Ephesus, whom he loved dearly. He can kind of get an inkling of that love back in the book of Acts, where uh, on his way to Jerusalem, Jerusalem for the last time, he stopped to meet with the Ephesian elders on the shore and uh, expressed his love for them and encouraging them to continue on for the Lord because he said he probably would not see them again. And that moved all of their hearts. So now in verse 3, we see as he begins the letter uh, that he's writing now, his heart was filled with praise to God. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was praising the Lord. And... Uh, why? Because he was thinking about the spiritual blessings that he and the Ephesians had received from God. He says, who has blessed us. So he's including them in those, those thoughts too. And all the spiritual blessings, he said, that are in heavenly places in Christ. Now, notice these weren't things that they were waiting to receive someday. He says, he hath blessed us. That's past tense. They had already received them. And he just was trying to make them aware of that. So as he rejoiced, he wanted them to rejoice as they considered, as they thought about these spiritual blessings together as he wrote, as they read. Now I was thinking, with all the challenges that have come our way in 2020, it probably, uh, the year will probably not make the list of one of the best years of our lives. 
Yet, the songwriter reminds us that when we get discouraged, we should count our blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. Even in a Roman prison, the Apostle Paul could praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he could be thankful for the spiritual blessings that he was listing here. And we can realize that they are ours as well if we're in Christ Jesus. And throughout the passage, you say, in him or in whom or in Christ. So it it all comes to us because of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved here this evening, these are your special bless, uh, spiritual blessings as well as mine. So I thought tonight we'd uh, briefly consider them together. So looking on to verse 4, it says, as According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. First spiritual blessing, we have been chosen to be holy. The word holy is the same root word as the word sanctified and sanctification, which you can see in other passages of the scripture. So think of it. What he's saying here is before the world was created, God decided that those who received Christ would be sanctified. That is, set apart from the world and from sin and set apart to God. Sanctification has two parts to it. It's a taking from things that we need to be removed from and bringing us to God and to his service. And uh, that's the idea wherever you see that, the sanctification or being holy and so forth. Now, sanctification has three tenses to it, past, present, and future. Past sanctification, the very moment that you and I received Christ, we were totally cleansed and made holy before God. It has a present tense. As we grow in Christ, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, as we follow Jesus, we are progressively becoming more holy, more sanctified by surrendering to the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. And aren't you glad that the Comforter has come to do that work? Then there's a future tense to it. One day, we will stand in the presence of God, pure and holy, our sin nature gone forever. I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to that day. I hate it when I have to struggle with that sin nature day after day after day. Um, it's a reality, and probably it's my fault that I struggle with it so much. But it's, it's something that will be glad it will be gone. So this is a miracle. It's miraculous that God could and would do this for the sinful creatures that we once were. But he did, and he does, and he will. All three tenses working. He will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And that truth is walking with Jesus and growing in him who is the truth. So sanctification, great spiritual blessing for us. Verse 5, here's another one. Having predestinated us into the, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. We've been predestinated unto the adoption of being children. Again, God decided beforehand. That's literally what predestinated means. God decided beforehand that those who received Christ would be officially adopted as a child of the Father. Joint heirs with Christ, as we're told in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. In Roman society, in which Paul was writing the context in, a person could be adopted as a son or a daughter and become the legal heir of the adopter's estate. Are you, if, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Ben-Hur. It's, it's kind of a neat story. There used to be a movie years ago. It's probably uh, before your time, maybe. I don't know. But uh, it was fun to watch. Uh, and in the course of the story, Ben-Hur uh, wrongfully gets sent to a galley slave ship, and he becomes a slave on the ship. And they have a, battles and so forth. The, uh, the ship sinks, and he saves the life of the, the Roman general that was on board the ship. And as a result, out of gratefulness, the Roman general uh, takes, frees him from slavery and adopts him as his own son. The Roman general Arius uh, did that officially, did that illegally. And Ben-Hur then uh, became his legal heir. And when Arius died, which wasn't too long after that, he inherited everything that was in the, in the Roman general's estate. His 
his basically his, his position of honor and, and all the riches that he had. So Ben-Hur became a rich man overnight. And uh, he goes on to, to use those riches as the story. You'll have to read the book to find out what happens after that. But that kind of gives us a picture. Uh, Lou Wallace, the writer, was giving us a, a, a picture of what was true in the Roman society back at that time. And we can relate that to the scriptures here because that's just what God has done for us. We have been legally, officially been adopted into the royal family of God. And Jesus Christ, is we're joint heirs with him. He is the beloved son of the father, but we're joint heirs with him. And we have that position in the family of the king of heaven. Wow, that's all I've got to say. That's tremendous. Number, th uh, number three, in verse six, it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, and of course, he's stopping there to thank the Lord for that adoption, verse five. But then the next clause there, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We have been made accepted in the beloved. Now, you know who that beloved is, right? The Lord Jesus. Remember, uh, several times while Jesus was ministering on this earth, God the Father actually spoke out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So he's the beloved. And I'm not sure why the uh, authors didn't capitalize that, but that's, uh, in my mind, that's capitalized. That's Jesus. And we are in him. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there any danger or even possibility of Jesus falling out of favor with his father? It's not going to happen. No way. So it is with you and me. So, that, so it is with you and me. Because we are accepted as fully as Jesus is because we're accepted in him. I like what, the way one preacher puts it. When God looks at us, he has the sun in his eyes. Not the S-U-N, the S-O-N. That's pretty neat. So he sees us as he sees Jesus. That's tremendous. Wonderful reality. Accepted. So that means when we go to God, we're accepted. We don't have to make ourselves accepted. We don't have to do anything to make ourselves acceptable to God. We're already accepted fully. And we can go to him any time. He encourages us to come again and again and again uh, in the Bible. And so we just need to be, make ourselves aware of that. Remind ourselves of it. You know, the enemy doesn't want us to understand that. He wants us to feel down on ourselves. And, and when we fail, he, wants, us, he may, wants to maximize that failure and make us forget who we really are. But we, don't, we never lose any acceptance in God the Father's sight. We never do. He's unchangeable, remember? And he loves you as much as he ever will love you. And he'll never love you any less. It's a constant, unchangeable love. We're totally accepted in the beloved. When you start feeling down or unworthy sometime, think about that. You and I will never, ever lose our acceptance by the Father, no matter what, because it is based on Jesus, not on us, the beloved of the Father. There's a great illustration of that back in the Old Testament. So let's take some time to look there. 2 Samuel chapter 19. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So since I'm preaching, I get to spend some time on it. Second Samuel chapter 19. Now, to fill you in, in the story here, this is when Absalom has rebelled against his father David. David has had to flee for his life from Jerusalem. And upon that, top of that, the grief, of course, of having his own son trying to usurp the kingdom away from him trying to destroy everything about him. And uh, what a time of grief this was for David. But in spite of all that, there were people that were there to help him, to bring relief to him. And the, he and the people that were fleeing with him out of Jerusalem into the wilderness, there were some people that cared about him. In fact, jump back to uh, chapter 17 a minute. Uh, Absalom and, and uh, the armies of Israel are getting ready to mount up their attack. David's heading uh, for hiding. And while he's out there, of course, they had to leave quickly. He didn't bring a lot of things with him for sustenance. And in verse 27 there, it came to pass when David was come to Mahanaim 
that Shobi, the son of Nahash of Rabbah of the children of Ammon, and Maker, the son of Amio of Lodabar, by the way, he's the one who took care of uh, Mephibosheth for many years before David adopt, adopted him into his palace. And then thirdly, Barzillai, the Gileadite, Gileadite of Rogelim. Now, Gilead was the land across the Jordan River, and he, that's where he was from. As David came over there, he wanted to help him as well. And what did they do? They brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David and for the people that were with him to eat. For they said, the people's hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So they took it upon their hearts to care about King David and the people that were with him. He knew they had needs, or they knew that he had needs, and they wanted to meet them. And uh, they didn't want them to be, in spite of living out there in the wilderness, they didn't want them to be hungry or weary or thirsty. And they did all that they could to make, that, uh, make them feel better in the terrible circumstances that they were in. So uh, once the battle was done, once Absalom was finished, and it was time for David to return, um, he was, it, it became a royal procession back toward Jerusalem. And they got to the Jordan River to cross, and there were a number of people that were almost arguing over the fact that they wanted to bring the, the king across. Uh, but one of those people that was there to bring the king across Jordan was Barzillai. So over in chapter 19, verse 31, Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogelim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Now Barzillai was a very aged man, even four score years old. I'm not saying anything about any of us that are getting there. Uh, but back in those days especially, 80 years was quite ancient. And he had provided the king, notice reminding us, he had provided the king of sustenance while he, while he lay at Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. So he was a rich man, but he was willing to use his riches uh, for the sake of others. And so the king appreciated it. In verse 33, the king said unto Barzillai, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. Okay, you took care of me, so I want to take care of you. I want to repay you, and I'm a king. I'm able to repay you a whole, back, a whole bunch more than you paid me with. But verse 34, Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king into Jerusalem? I am this day fourscore years old. Can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? Now back in those days they didn't have the hearing aids and all that stuff. I mean, he just couldn't hear. He couldn't see much. Uh, he couldn't even taste food. I mean, he was ready to die. And he said, if I go with you, King David, I'll just be a burden to you. I'll just be a problem. So he says in verse 36, thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king. And why should the king recompense it to me, such a reward? Barzillai gave what he gave to King David, not for reward. He wasn't looking for anything back. He just wanted to help the king. And of course, that heart is what David appreciated. Okay, verse 37, let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again. After I get you over the river, David, I'm going to go back home, that I may die in mine own city and be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. But behold thy servant Chimham, let him go over with my lord the king, and do to him what shall seem good unto thee. So he, he makes an offer to David. He said, I don't want you to do anything for me, but if you really want to do something for me, do it to Chimham. Now Chimham, actually, if, if we look at some other passages of scripture, we won't take time tonight, but he's Barzillai's son. And so he's offering Chimham uh, to receive the blessings that David wanted to give to Barzillai. Instead, he's going to be Barzillai's substitute. So verse 38, the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me, and I will do to him that which shall seem good unto thee, and whatsoever thou shalt require of me, that will I do for thee. And all the people went over Jordan. When the king was come over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him. And he, Barzillai, returned unto his own place. Now that's the end of what we hear about Chimham here. But later on in the scriptures, we find that uh, he established a place in, near the city of Bethlehem, which was David's city. And uh, his ancestors, or his descendants, continued to live there. And he is associated with that city later on in the history of Israel. 
So he, David did indeed was true to his word and, and blessed Chimham. Now, why was he blessing Chimham? He didn't know Chimham. He didn't know Chimham from anybody else. This is the first he met him. But he was doing it for the sake of Barzillai. There's the principle of substitution. Chimham was Barzillai's substitute to receive all the blessings that King David wanted to give. What a perfect illustration of what God the Father does to us. Uh, he wants to bless Jesus, his beloved. But Jesus says, bless these that are in me. Bless my newly adopted children. Bless the ones who have called upon me for salvation. And uh, the Father says, okay, I will. I'll bless them too, just like I want to bless you. Isn't that tremendous? Accepted, accepted in the beloved in Jesus Christ. That's a great spiritual blessing. Okay, back to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 7. In whom, of course that's Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have redemption through his blood. Let's look at another passage of scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1, we'll look down in verses 18 and 19. Peter, thinking about the salvation that's been given him and us, he says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The most precious substance in all the universe is the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of God, we're told in, in the book of Acts. And Jesus' blood was the redemption price for us. We have redemption with that wonderful price of his shed blood. Uh, the picture of redemption in the Bible is the picture of a slave on an auction block. They're lined up there. They're offered for sale. And maybe the auctioneer is trying to show you how strong or how handsome or beautiful this particular slave is and wanting to get a high price for them. And someone buys the slave and then sets them free with the promise of never being sold again. That's the picture of redemption. We were bought out of slavery to sin and to our sin nature. We were redeemed with the blood of Jesus Christ and then set free. And we never have to be in slavery to that again. Now, sometimes we choose to go back in slavery to it, how foolish we are. Uh, but we don't have to be. We never have to be again. We're set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. The price has been paid and it won't have to be paid again. It carries with it, and notice even in this passage, uh, in whom we have redemption through his blood, comma, the forgiveness of sins. The redemption carries with us the forgiveness of sins. So, if when the accuser of the brethren, you know who that is, right? He tries to bring our sins up. John reminds us we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Martha Snell Nicholson was a, a, a devotional poem writer. She wrote several poems that are just a blessing to read if you ever get a chance to read any of them. She has one called The Advocate. I meant to bring it tonight, but I forgot it. So you'll have to dig it up yourself. But it's worth digging up. Uh, the, it's got two stanzas. And the first stanza uh, pictures Satan standing before God and pointing out how wicked we were and how we failed him and we chose to disobey him and we're guilty. And he says, should the guilty sinner get off free? He says, no, you and your word, Satan says, said that the, sinner, the guilty sinner should die. And so I demand the just penalty. And then the second stanza opens up, and Jesus Christ stands before the Father. And he says, what the enemy has said is true. They are guilty. But Father, take a look at my hands. Take a look at my feet. I paid the price. Uh, yes, they did sin, but I paid for the sin. They get to go free. And so the, the poem closes with the fact that Satan just flees away because he's got nothing more to say. He can't answer to that. And uh, I don't, that's maybe a fanciful picture, 
but we can imagine that that's still the way it is. I mean, the accuser of brethren still apparently has some access into heaven. Book of Job describes it. There'll be a day, Revelation tells us, when he's going to be cast out for, for good. But until that time, apparently he has some access. And he's called the accuser of, our, of the brethren in Revelation chapter 12. So no doubt he's taking advantage of every opportunity to accuse us. And he doesn't have to make up things either, does he? We are guilty many times when we ought not to be. But Jesus, our advocate, can stand before the Father in our defense and proclaim that the price has already been paid. And you can't get double jeopardy in heaven's court even any more than you can in American courts. At least they're supposed to be. But in heaven, it's not that's supposed to be. You, can't be. you don't have to pay for your sins again. Jesus already paid for them. And we get to go free. So we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness, complete and utter total forgiveness of our sins. Another blessing, uh, verses 7 and 8 together, it goes on to say, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Another spiritual blessing we have is the riches of the grace of God. And uh, imagine that. I mean, there's no limit to that. God's grace. And it abounds toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So there's just a whole lot contained in there. Uh, too much to talk about now. But at least let me mention one thing. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Oh, let's, let's back up to get in context. Verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he without sin. Because we have that kind of a high priest who cares for us and has opened the door for us, then verse 16... Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Notice grace. The throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. When? In time of need. That's what Paul's talking about. The riches of his grace abounding toward us. Uh, we can come anytime, anytime to the throne of grace and find all the grace that we need for whatever situation we're in. Too often we neglect that opportunity. But we're urged in the scriptures to do it. Uh, any need, big or small, bring it to the throne of grace. And God's riches of grace are abounding toward us to meet that need. That's a wonderful blessing too, isn't it? Okay, back in Ephesians 1, <clears throat> verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. He's made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now, Paul talks about the mystery in several of his letters. In fact, even in Ephesians later, chapter 3, we'll not take time to look at it all, but he describes the mystery. And what a mystery is, uh, is something that uh, used to be unknown, didn't, un not understood, but now has been revealed. So it's not a mystery that we're still trying to figure out. It was revealed to us by, by the Lord through the Apostle Paul and in the Scriptures. And uh, suffice it to say that as Paul describes the mystery in Ephesians chapter 3, Gentiles and Jews, that is any of us and all of us, are fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. And we are also partakers of the unsearchable riches of Christ. To say it another way, there are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. We're all on the same level, and it's the highest level. Tremendous blessing. Okay, back in Ephesians 1. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, we might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's in Jesus again. Okay, so what do we have there? We have a bright future. We're going to be gathered together in one in Christ. Jesus prayed for that, didn't he? Does Jesus get his prayers answered? Always, always. And so he prayed back in John chapter 17 that one day, uh, he and his disciples would be one, and then all of those who would hear the gospel through their ministry. That gets down to us. We're all going to be one. We're going to be gathered together in one. Look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. We have a dis somewhat of a description of that. In 
in the course of what he's writing here, and we won't go into all that, but, but Paul mentions the, this in verse 22, 23, 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and that's the heavenly Mount Zion, uh, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now, in the Hebrews, Paul was trying to uh, open the eyes of the Hebrews to all that they had in Jesus Christ. When they received Christ and the things that were given them, they didn't have to go back to the Old Testament laws and ceremonies and so forth. They were not needful anymore. They had Jesus and all that goes with him. So he's reminding them about that. And here he's looking forward to the day. You know, uh, the, the total church has never been assembled yet. We still assemble in local churches. And that's God's design here for the present time. We're learning that in Sunday school. Uh, but there's going to be a day when every saved person, every person that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, is going to assemble together. That's going to be the general assembly in church of the firstborn. And we're going to be there. If we've been saved by Jesus Christ, we're going to be part of that assembly. And it's going to be a glorious day because God's going to be there, the living God. There's going to be all the angels there. You can't even count them. And all the saved of all the ages are going to be there and uh, meeting together with Jesus. It's going to be a wonderful day. And we have that simply because we're in Christ. Spiritual blessing. Back to Ephesians 1. <clears throat> Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Very simply, we have obtained an inheritance. Now, why don't we have it right now? Lord, if I have an inheritance, can I have a couple thousand dollars or so? Well, if you got it now, you'd spend it up. When you get it in heaven, it's going to last forever. So those are those treasures in heaven. It's an inheritance that belongs to us. Peter, of course, mentions that in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll just turn there right quickly. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he says, uh, well, verse 3, Blessed be God. He's talking about blessings too. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. To what? To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Boy, I mean, he really gets into it there, doesn't he? It's an in, it, the inheritance is incorruptible. It's not going to get rot away or disappear, get smaller. It's going to be undefiled. It's going to be pure. No, nothing down here on the earth is going to be as pure like that. And it's not going to fade away, as things on earth do. Uh, and it's reserved in heaven for you. It's got your name on it. Yes. Wow. So we have that inheritance, and we have obtained it. Not we will obtain it. We have obtained it. It's ours. We just got to get there. Anybody want to go? Not tonight, huh? Okay, so that's ours. Then um, verses 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, that is in Christ, you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you, you heard the, the gospel, you believed it, you put your faith, your trust in Jesus, and as soon as you did that, you were, right, that after is not like time-wise, it was an instantaneous thing. You, when, when you and I believed, we were sealed at that point with the Holy Spirit of promise. It was the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We were sealed with the earnest of the Holy Spirit. The word sealed there uh, is like a stamp that, include, that indicates ownership, security, and destination. It was, it was a legal thing that they did back in the Bible days uh, that was put on a person uh, of, of some kind of, I'm not exactly didn't necessarily have to be a physical stamp, but it indicated ownership. So that's what it does for us. The Holy Spirit indicates we belong to God. And it's secure. It's unlosable. That's not, if that's a word. And uh, it's going to bring us to a destination. We already looked at that. It's a mark that indicates that we are gods, we will always be gods, and we will end up with him forever. How can you beat that? And the Holy Spirit himself is the seal. 
the, the earnest there is a pledge or a down payment of money or property given in advance, indicating that the whole thing will be paid. So imagine that. God gave us the Holy Spirit as an advance payment. Wow. The Holy Spirit himself is that earnest. And if you're saved here today, the Holy Spirit is there dwelling in you. you are the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in Greek society, that pledge would be forfeited if the purchase wasn't completed. Well, you know what? God's not going to forfeit the Holy Spirit. So that purchase is going to be completed. We have a, not just a hope like a hope so. We have a, 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 an established hope that is ours. Uh, so in other words, God has given us the Holy Spirit who indwells in salvation as a promise that he will give us our reserved place in the heavenly kingdom. And we can be assured that he will keep that promise because he's not going to give up the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. What a list. What a list of blessing after blessing. We're made holy, set aside to, Jesus, to God and Jesus. We're adopted into his royal family. We're accepted by God just as Jesus is. We're redeemed, forgiven. The riches of grace are available to us. We're revealed to be fellow heirs in his kingdom. We're promised to be gathered together with all that are his one day. We have an incorruptible inheritance, and we are sealed to top it all off with the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. It's already completed. It's ours right now, today. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for not only giving us these wonderful blessings, but making us aware of it, revealing it to us in the scriptures that you put in our hands. Thank you for that. Thank you that uh, we're privileged uh, of over many people in the world to be able to hold a, a, a copy of the scriptures in our hands where we can pick it up and read it any time. And Lord, help us not to look uh, lightly upon it, what you've done for us, but to rejoice in it and uh, to, with our hearts, serve you in gratefulness for what you've done for us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have some men ready to take an offering here this evening. All right, Brother Lippert, would you lead us please in prayer?